Alright, with this set of notes you need to stop or pause this video and you need to set up your page for Cornell Notes. What I will tell you is you're going to need a little bit more space here, so I'd say the margin plus about four lines down. And once you've done that, again, you can put the intro, this is Unit 1, Intro to Bio, Unit 1, and this is the Remote Bio Notes. So we're doing B2C and B2D in this one. These are all process teaks. These are science processes that you need to know how to do. So some of these you should be familiar with. Most of them you should be familiar with because they've been in your fifth grade science teaks, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade science teaks all the way throughout here. So I'm going to expand this, bring this up a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. And the B2C and D are really long teaks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify them just a little bit so they're not quite so long. So B2C says that you're going to know scientific theories are based on natural and physical phenomena. And I'm going to abbreviate scientific theories. So this is no, you need to know this. Scientific theories are based on natural and physical phenomena. Phenomena. My phenomena just went off the end of the page there. And are capable of being tested by multiple independent researchers. This is a big deal. They're capable of being tested by multiple independent researchers. And unlike hypotheses, scientific theories are well-established and highly reliable explanation. Well-established, so they are well-established and highly reliable explanations. but they can be changed when we have more data. Okay, They can be changed when we have new scientific technology. So they can be changed when we have new data and new technology. Sometimes we just don't have the technology to study things and all of a sudden there's a breakthrough in technology and we can get a lot more information. So that's B2C. B2D goes hand in hand with this. So I'm going to put a little square here that kind of stands it out just a little bit. Here's B2D. And B2D says you need to distinguish between hypotheses and theories. Distinguish between. Tell the difference between hypotheses and theories. Hypotheses. Woo and theories. And I'm going to add something because it needs to be there and I don't know why it's not. I'm going to put in parentheses and laws. Okay. So this is a really word. This is probably one of the most amount that you're going to write here at the top on the Cornell notes. But these things go hand in hand together. So if you look at this the first thing we need to look at, and I'm going to grab a different color here so it stands out a little bit more. The first thing we need to look at is that theories are, um, 
used to explain natural phenomena by linking multiple hypotheses. So here's the first thing. So again, hypotheses don't grow up to be theories. A hypothesis will never turn into a theory, ever. A hypothesis ends up being one piece of a theory. So a theory can be made of, you know, 25 different hypotheses that are linked together. So theories are used to explain natural phenomena. Again, you've heard that phrase before, natural phenomena, things, phenomena, things that we see in nature, natural phenomena by, here's the key, by linking multiple, and I'm going to put the word in parentheses, durable. Durable means they stand the test of time. If you have a durable um, pair of jeans, it means they're tough. They can withstand a lot. They're tough. They can stay around for a long time. Durable hypotheses. And the key here is that they are well-established. Theories are well-established. They're not fly-by-night. They're not going to go away in one day. Well-established and highly reliable. So when we say it's the self-theory, we don't just say, oh, it's a theory. It's, it's not that big a deal. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a big, big deal. They are highly reliable. So examples of this would be something like the cell theory. All living things are made of cells, only cells reproduce cells, right? You've heard of the cell theory before, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, the gene theory. The gene theory says that you have two genes for every trait, and that all of your characteristics are, are controlled by their genes. The germ theory. We just take these and say, you know, these are just true, true, true. So the germ theory would be one where it says a lot of diseases are caused by germs. The evolutionary theory, and this is one where people like to say, oh, no, this is just a theory. It's not a big deal. Well, it's just as much of a solid theory as the cell theory or the gene theory or the germ theory. It's just that a lot of people don't like it because they're under the misapprehension that, oh, well, the evolutionary theory says God doesn't exist. Well, we've talked about that in the last notes. Um, the science is what can't take into account God or no God. The science can't deal with that, so it's limited to see, hear, taste, touch, smell. Atomic theory would be another. You could list several theories, but remember that these theories are subject to change. Um, some theories that have changed over time, and I'm going to give you some examples of these. I'm going to grab a different color. These theories are always true. These theories changed. An example would be spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation was the theory that life could come from non-life. And spontaneous generation said, oh, hey, all of a sudden, all these flies grew in this meat. And I had the meat covered up with something or other. Well, what they didn't realize is what, when the meat was uncovered, the flies came along and laid eggs. Then when they covered it, the eggs were already there. It wasn't that flies come from rotten meat, which, is one of the the which was one of the hypotheses. It's that we didn't see the eggs there. So that theory of spontaneous generation is something that is a theory that is no longer. Um, another one would be like uh, maternal impression, um, that whenever a woman's pregnant, that if she experiences things when she's pregnant, that will affect how the baby looks. That was a, the that was a scientific theory at a time, and it was really common. Uh, let's see, the humor theory. The humor is like um, your body is made up of four humors, red bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. I'm sorry, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. The guy, Hippocrates, came up with that and said, hey, these are all the four liquids in the body, and if you're sick, then it must be that they're out of balance. So if you have a fever, your skin is flushed, well, you must have too much blood, so let's just take some out. That was the humoral theory of things. Good thing that one's not around anymore for us. So these are theories that, that are, they had them for a while, but they realized, hey, these are not great things, so we can change. Once they have more data, better technology, then we can deal with that. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to grab a different color here, 
is that we can talk about laws. And laws, laws only describe the natural phenomena. They don't explain it. Laws describe. So look up here. Theories are used to explain the natural phenomena. Laws describe natural phenomena. They don't explain anything. And there's a big difference between that. So here, if we have the theory of or the law of gravity, so here we have something called the law of gravity. Basically, it's an attraction between two bodies. It doesn't explain what's going on. It just said, hey, this is what it is. And it has um, an equation. A lot of cases they have equations. So the equation might look something like that. So there's the equation to calculate gravity. But that's it. There's nothing to explain it. Um, it doesn't explain why. Theories explain why something is the way it is. Laws just say this is what is. It's the law of gravity. It's the law of inertia. You guys already know the law of inertia. One of Newton's three laws. A body at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. A body in motion stays in motion in a straight line, constant speed, unless acted upon by an outside force. It doesn't say why it's moving. It doesn't say why it's doing this at all. It just says, here's what we've seen to be true. A body at rest stays at rest. A body in motion stays in motion until acted upon by an outside force. So we have hypothesis, which we've just defined on the page previous to that. Hypothesis is an educated guess to a very small question. And then we have theories, which are a multitude of hypotheses put together to try and explain what we see in nature. And then we have laws, which are not explaining anything. They just describe, here's what we see. We saw this. Hey, the sun rises every day. We saw that. Hey, we have a uh, physical gravitational attraction to the earth. So when you jump up, you're going to jump. It's, you're going to fall back down to the planet. It just, ex it just says, this is what we see. That's what a law does. So theories are never, ever, ever going to become laws. So even though you say this is a cell theory, why isn't it a law? That's not how it works. Okay? So scientific theories are based on natural and physical phenomena. They're capable of being tested by multiple independent researchers. And here's a big one, too, multiple independent researchers. A few years ago, um, I think a lab in Russia discovered one of those elements that they hadn't named yet. And they claimed that they got it and they had it, but when people tried in different labs across the world to try to do their same experiment, they didn't come up with the same thing. They couldn't get it to work. And so Russia didn't get to name that element, and they were not happy. The Russian lab wasn't happy about it, but it couldn't be um, tested by different researchers. So if you can't test it from different researchers, then it's not going to work at all distinguish between the hypothesis and the theories. We know what the theory is. Now we can tell is that a hypothesis or is that a theory?